Good morning, everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. Um, Cynthia, I'm showing that you're muted. Can you give me a little audio test, please? Okay, I'm unmuted now. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right, well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, a little after 11, so we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Wes Burke. I'm with Emerald Scientific. I want to take a minute and thank you for participating in the call and uh, for participating in the program. As I said, for the uh, potency analysis, which is your participation that makes these programs possible, and we're extremely grateful. We think it's a very valuable resource, not only for your labs, but for the industry as a whole. I wanted to uh, talk about logistics just for a brief moment. Uh, we're using GoToMeeting, and I'm going to try to ask everyone to, to keep their microphones muted if possible. And if you have questions, please enter them in the chat and select uh, to send it to the administrator uh, or the organizer. And that way I can manage the questions and we will handle them at the end of the presentation. I want to mention that there was a little snafu this morning in sending out the reminders for the meetings. The um, potency review was at 10 a.m. If you missed that, we apologize if it was due to our confuse, confusing you, but the, uh, the event was recorded and we will get it distributed to you immediately. Um, this is a review of the residual, residual solvent um, PT. And if you have, if you missed the, the potency review and you have questions, email them to us. We will address all of your questions and concerns. Um, this presentation as well is being recorded and we will distribute it as, um, as well as the potency review soon. So with that said, I want to thank the advisory panel. Sean Kastner, Dr. Roger Volker, Cynthia Ludwig, Dr. Robert Martin, and Tammy Musich. Um, their participation in this program has really expedited the evolution. Um, I think a special thanks to AOCS is, is necessary for the data analytics. That has, um, of course, elevated the, um, the data analysis of this um, tremendously, and we're very grateful for that partnership. We also want to say thanks to Absolute Standards, Stephen Arpey and Melissa Stonier. And uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to Ken Snoke, the president of Emerald Scientific. Ken, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Wes. Can you tell from your side if, if um, we have anybody participating in this that did not participate in the potency, or do we not know? Uh, we do have a couple, yes. Okay. Well, I'm sorry to those that had to listen to me um, do this just an hour ago. But, um, thanks, everybody, for being here and participating. Just to be clear, I know there's um, different uh, folks involved in this PT. Because of the uh, constraints of the industry, we don't have quite the selection that a lot of other industries do for uh, proficiency testing. And so, um, you know, Emerald Scientific got involved in this a couple of years ago, primarily just to promote, uh, you know, labs to take proficiency testing, and then uh, we saw the the potential value that an inner lab comparison would start to bring to the industry to elucidate uh, trends and areas for improvement and questions that need to be answered and, and things that uh, inner lab comparisons do. So um, <clears throat> to that end, we've been promoting. Uh, an ILCPT once or twice a year, and this year um, it was evident that that we were no longer in a position to make the kinds of decisions that needed to be made. Um, you know, we weren't qualified to decide what analyte should be tested, let's say, in a given test. Um, you know, what the concentration should be, any of those types of things. So we we put together an advisory panel of folks with a lot of experience in proficiency testing, and also some representatives of the testing industry. Um, if anybody has an interest to participate in that advisory panel, please, uh, in the future, please let us know. And so what we ended up with was kind of a, a an ILCPT um, that was put together from multiple participants. We had absolute standards manufacturing the, uh, the samples in this case, and then data 
um, being analyzed by uh, AOCS, as Wes mentioned, and then Emerald Scientific really just promoting the test and giving an avenue for purchasing it through the website and things of that nature. So um, let's see, with that I think I'll, I'll turn it over to Cynthia Lowe to start um, looking at the data. Um, you know, this was a challenging test. It was a, it was a big decision to try to launch into the uh, residual solvent PT arena. Um, like with the potency testing, you know, questions are always there. What what analyte should we test for? What's the best solvent? You know, obviously a, an appropriate matrix that mimics something like folks are seeing on a daily basis <clears throat> uh, would be a direction that we'd like to go into in the future. But I think when we start a new uh, interlab comparison and a new uh, category of tests, in this case residual solvents, it we've learned in the past that it makes a little bit of sense to keep it a little bit on the simple side right out of the gate because if we go if we take on too much and you just have two varied results it's difficult to make heads and tails of it and know what to do next so um, absolute standards already had been making a residual solvent PT of 10 components we asked folks to submit data on five of, of, of those specifically. Um, some participants went ahead and submitted data on all ten, but only the five that were required uh, were used for, for the data analysis um, portion of that. So um, with that, Cynthia, I think, uh, why don't you show us some data? Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone and thank you for t participating. Um, you see up on my screen how we uh, crunch the data. It's very important to have your dog sitting on your lap while you're uh, going through all of this. Um, so as AOCS um, put all of the uh, solvent, residual solvent data through our analysis, we generate these reports. We do these, these are standard reports that will be customized in the future for Emerald. Um, notably, it, you see 215 here. Um, that is our fourth quarter because our Lab proficiency programs run not on a yearly basis by the calendar year, but we start July 1. Um, so we'll be changing that for next year. So if anyone has any concerns about the 2015, I can um, send you a note from your regulator to make sure that this was a 2016 report. Uh, let's jump right into the summary. Here is a list of all the anal analysts who participated. You received an email from me that said what your analyst number so you know where your data is. Um, heptane, hexane, butane, isobutane, and isopropanol were the um, solvents that we asked you to report to. And as you can see, many people went ahead and reported all 10, which is fine. The second page of the, or on the first page, you will also see a little G every so often and that means that is a grubbed outlier and that value was thrown out when the consensus mean was calculated by our, our statistics program. Our statistics program is a custom program that is ISO 13528 compliant. We use those guidelines to do our analysis so um, for an ISO certification these reports um, follow those guidelines. So after the uh, Grubbs outliers are removed, the system calculates the z-scores. And here we see the summary of the z-scores. Um, anything you see that is in red is three or more standard deviations outside the consensus mean. Anything in yellow is between two and three standard deviations from the consensus mean. And everything in black falls within two standard deviations of the consensus mean. Um, down here at the bottom, you see a list of all of the different things that are calculated from the consensus mean. This assigned value is actually the consensus mean from the data set. It is not the assigned value from the vendor. Uh, we will show that data later. Um, one of the other things I really um, like about the, this reporting system is it charts the Z scores in, in a graph that makes it very easy for you to look at your analyst number and see how you compare with everyone else. Um, the things to really pay attention to are which way are your arrows pointing. If your error in your method were random, then there should be cases 
as in 2558, and I'm just picking that one randomly, where they're a little bit above and then a little bit of below. Um, so they they are bouncing above and below the consensus mean, which means that that error probably is, is random, unlike um, another lab, 1060, who seems to be having a little bit of a calibration error, um, where all of their points are higher and sometimes significantly higher than the consensus mean. That would just be an indication that you need to go back and look at how you're running your method and your procedures and your calibration. So this is a, this is just another piece of information for you to use to see whether or not you have um, a bias in your method or if you're following um, falling in line with everyone else. The third thing that you get on these reports is the kernel density plot. These are plots that show where all of the analysts fell on a normalized curve. Um, it also gives you an indication of how um, tightly the group is assigning the value to that particular analyte. Uh, two good examples here would be, here's the acetone. You, you have a pretty wide spread in acetone. Um, it looks like you have a couple of different groups that are getting different answers. Unlike acetonitrile, which is a much, much thinner curve, and everybody's really a lot tighter, except for the one person who was um, way out of the spec. So we can take a look at all of these kernel density plots. Um, this one on isopropanol seems to have given, we, we seem to have two sets of groups. This looks bimodal. Um, I don't, I can't explain it because we don't know exactly all the methods that were used specifically, but uh, it could be a difference in method on this kind of thing, but these charts are just an indication of, of where we might be able to tighten up the precision and accuracy of our methods in the future. And here's the last one. Wow, look at hexane. That's really impressive. I mean, everybody is just right there, except for, for two folks. Um, that's a pretty impressive curve. You don't see that very often in an analytical method. Um, you all received these uh, charts, and if you have any questions, please do send them to Wes. Now I'm going to switch over to some additional data that we calculated. Um, these, these were... Uh, done by me and Sean and Roger, and we just wanted to compare uh, the, the kernel density plots, break them down a little bit further by method to see if we could see a bias in method. Um, I will say that in the future, as we run proficiency testing, we will change the tickets such that you enter your specific method and that's recorded, so it's a little bit easier to, to pull out if we have any method bias. And then Sean Kastner is going to be looking into, um, are there some published methods that have been proven um, over time to, to be very robust and, and, and give good answers? So we, might, we may in the future have a suggestion of which um, method or procedures you might use to, to run these tests. Um, going into the first set of extra data, here's the isobutane results. You can see that the assigned value from the vendor was 51.9, however the consensus mean was 31.8. Um, we're not quite sure why we have such a discrepancy between the assigned value and the consensus mean but I have shown the two standard deviation by the orange bars, and this is one of the results that, that was a little bit more varied. The isopropanol kernel density plot, again, shows probably two bimodal um, sets of data, and if you look at the different methods, it seems, it seems random. There's nothing that jumps out. Um, we had a couple methods we didn't know. There's the full extraction technique, GCFID. Um, then others ran just the GCFID, uh, some mass spec data. We didn't have enough of each one of the separate 
methods to apply any statistics to this. It seems to be random throughout the uh, data set. And butane was another one that was a little bit wider than we would have liked to have seen. And here the assigned value was actually slightly below what the consensus mean was. Moving on to n-heptane, um, pretty normalized around here except for two values that were a little bit high. The assigned value and the consensus mean for this analyte were very close to each other. And again, we don't really have a bias by method that is apparent from the small data set. And hexane was a very tight data set for those who were on the consensus mean. Um, on, this is kind of unusual that the uh, assigned value is far and above where everybody else was, um, with the consensus mean being 29 and the assigned value being 40.6. Okay. Um, so those are all of the extra graphs and data sets that um, we produced. In, in summary, we really couldn't, because of the low data set number and the uncertainty of what method everybody ran, we couldn't point to a bias of one method or another, and, and the uh, variation seems to just be random. Um, so with that, I think that uh, we can go to the questions, and I see that there is one up there. Um, what five analytes were required to be reported? Going back to this report, the first five, n-heptane, n-hexane, n-butane, isobutane, and isopropanol were the solvents that we asked everyone report on. And we have another question. How are you establishing acceptance criteria based on the varied results? So Ken, I can I can field the first part of that and then I'll let you take the second. Um, in general, when AOCS runs a lab proficiency program, we do not set a pass or fail. Uh, it could be dependent upon the regulations in your state um, with your accrediting body. And so we don't know what your qualifications are for you to maintain your lab status or credibility. Um, so we just put the data out there and it's up to you really to discuss it with your regulator or your accrediting body. Um, with that being said, Emerald has discussed this with the advisory group and they have set some criteria, and uh, I'll kind of go through it, and then, Ken, you can, can finish up on that. Um, the advisory group decided upon a two standard deviations from the consensus mean as a qualification for the badge on all analytes but one. So basically, we're allowing the lab to have one analyte that was a little bit further off than two standard deviations. For in the case of uh, solvent residue, that would mean you need five, four of the five scores under your number should be black. So in this case, 8843, you can see he has one, two, three, four scores that are within two standard deviations and then just one that was a little bit further out and that would qualify him for the Emerald Badge, as I understand it. Ken, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, that's right. That's what the, um, that's where we're at for the badge is out of the five required um, within, being within two standard deviations of four of the five um, is the requirement for the badge. And then like Cynthia said, for, you know, we don't, set pass fail criteria um, you know certainly with the degradation related to the these solvents I mean um, and the volatility of them 
um, you know, I really think it is a discussion between, you know, each lab and their accreditor looking at these results as it compares to the overall. I mean, here, you know, obviously for N-hexane, if we would have used the assigned value, we would have had uh, people much further off than using the consensus mean. And then there were a couple other examples where I saw uh, a couple uh, participants were very close to the assigned value. Um, so we'll have to look at that. I, I, I haven't looked at this data set. I will double check it to see how calculating the uh, badge requirements off of the consensus, consensus mean compares to the actual assigned value and see if that would create any changes um, in who, who gets a badge and we'll look at that. Yeah. And so there's another question. Um, does the hexane result mean that the standards themselves need better quality control? I do not know how those assigned values were were calculated when they were sent out. Um, we normally do not do an assigned value on a, in the lab proficiency program. Um, AOCS has always used the consensus mean in, in the thought that labs that do this for a living every day um, are going to be doing a good job and really should be comparable to one another, especially if you're using the same methods and using good calibration standards. Um, it's certainly something that we're going to look at and why why is the consensus mean so different from the assigned value. So we'll be talking about that with the vendor and hopefully we'll have that concern addressed in future PT. Yeah, and we will in the future um be recording what calibration standards participants are using. Um, and we might even look for something like residual solvent testing, uh, possibly even taking it with, with one standard, you know, the standard that you use in-house, and then maybe including a, a small amount of calibration standard and having everybody recalibrate with that and see if it pulls things in tighter. I know they've seen some of those results in some of the ring tests that were done in Colorado, uh, they did something similar to that. But it certainly looks like something is going on. I don't know, I, but it looks like something could be going on either with the sample itself or the standard. Cynthia, does this make sense? I mean, if, if you see something like this where the consensus mean almost across the board is, is you know, significantly lower than the, than the reported value, the assigned value, would that maybe lead towards the idea of sample degradation where if you saw the consensus mean higher than the reported value that would instead point towards degradation of the standard that they, the calibration standard because if the calibration standard is degrading wouldn't it you know, have the impact of shifting your score higher yes yes absolutely okay so maybe in a so, case like this yeah it's not so much a a standard, a calibration standard issue as it is maybe the sample itself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, definitely, you know, to be honest, everybody, when we, when we looked at doing this, it was a tough call to, to do an ILCPT and there were some uh, participants and panel members that to really thought we just might see data all over the place and in fact we didn't you know I mean I think there were a little bit wider spreads here and there but the, it's still pretty um, I think interesting data and it's it is bringing up some some good improvements that we can make in the test to further answer questions down the road but especially when you consider how volatile these are without specific, very defined and validated methods, especially in sample handling um, and things like that. For those of you that weren't on the potency call, next time around the way we're going to do this is we're going to open uh, for a few weeks for enrollment in a test. We'll get everybody enrolled and then we will close enrollment. We will have the tests manufactured and then on one day with the same shipping con uh, conditions which will be on ice, um, all the samples will be sent to participants on the same day overnight on ice. And so that way we will standardize uh, much more of the, the process of getting the samples in your hands. 
And then I think too um, we'll have hopefully much more information on recommended uh, handling of the of the samples because of the volatility. We still have time for a few more questions. If anybody wants to type one in, we we can field that. While we're waiting for someone to type in an answer, I I can let people know that you know we run about 44 different series. Um, at AOCS and our other lab proficiency programs, and we send out samples four times a year. So I look a lot. I look at a lot of these charts because <laughs> um, we do a, a manual inspection of all of the data before we post the, the reports. And I can tell you that um, even comparing these to well-established series in in other areas that have official recommended methods that most people use. These are not bad results. They they actually are really pretty good results, and I, I'm impressed that that we've been able to, without a standardized method, get this good of data and get people so close to the consensus mean. So I think overall that the labs should be proud of themselves that most of them are doing a very good job, and obviously, um, you know, 15 people aren't going to be wrong if they all have an N-butane number that's just right there. I think it's a, a really, it's a testament to how the industry is self-regulating and, and doing a very good job in the absence of federal regulation, official methods, and, and other, some of the other things that would lead to tight results. So we'll be looking at other tests for the, the fall round, um, possibly looking at some, some pesticide testing, maybe uh, residual solvents in some sort of matrix that more closely mimics things that, that uh, the labs see on a daily basis. Maybe wax or an oil has been discussed. Um, and a little bit improvement in the way the program is run, both from a, from a logistic standpoint of, of how the orders are taken and how the samples are sent. Also in the data reporting, we're really going to shoot for having everybody report their data directly through a portal to AOCS if we can make that happen. Um, and so we're looking forward to those improvements. Um, we have another question that uh, just came up. And the question is, can internal PT standards from Absolute for example, be utilized for state regulation. Um, and I don't know what state you're in, but I would say that uh, that would be a discussion that you would need to have with your state regulator. Um, if you use the data that we've shared with you today, you have an ISO 13528 compliant Z-score consensus mean report, and then you also have a report um, breaking it down by method with assigned values, two standard deviations, and the consensus mean to share with them. So I think just having a conversation with that regulator, showing them what you have and how you've participated, I would hope that that would satisfy any regulations they'd have, but I, I can't make that call. But I think we've certainly given you enough ammo to make a good case for it. Yeah, and I think have, most of the... No, oh, sorry, Cynthia. I think most of the analysis that you know, that we're trying to provide here is really how it relates to the inner lab comparison component. Um, you know, and that's that's to identify trends that can help the industry as far as methods or, or things like we're talking about, you know, uh, standards and, and things of that nature. I get the absolute standards as an ISO 17043 accredited PT provider, so certainly if, if they've uh, provided reports um, those should be and, and have been in the past sufficient for for state regulators and accreditors and things like that. Ken and Cynthia, I sent you one more question. Okay. Um, how will you choose the pesticides? Since there are so many different state standards with only some of the pesticides overlapping. Oh wow guys, I'm not even touching this one. I'm well, gonna punt. <laughs> that's a great question, and we're we certainly are open to any input um, from anybody. 
you know, one strategy has been to, you know, get the broadest coverage we can based on different state requirements um, and include a series of pesticides in a sample and maybe even in participants' labs from different states maybe will report back on different ones depending on their state requirements. That'd be one possibility. Another would be to pick just, you know, again, this, this strategy of starting a little more on the simple side than, than complex so that we get useful data right out of the gate and then, you know, with the goal of, of improving on that and, and growing in the direction of, of more and more analytes and, and different matrices and things like that. I think, you know, another strategy would be choose maybe just a couple of the most common pesticides that um, are problem pesticides in each of the of the categories, so organochlorine and, and you know the different uh, pesticide categories. So there's a few different strategies that the advisory panel is going to be looking at for choosing those. But please let us know if you either want to participate in that process or have any um, suggestions or recommendations or ideas. It's a tough one, though. And that's exactly why we formed the advisory panel, because the short answer to that is I certainly don't know. So we need to get folks uh, with some experience in that area to help us out. Absolutely. Um, and as we're waiting for another question to come in, I can give you guys a little uh, preview of, of what it might look like to log into the automated system at AOCS. Um, we, we're thinking of using this system um, for data entry um, next session and basically you get an analyst number and a password and you log into the system and you get a dashboard and on that dashboard are everything you might want to do so all your enrollment dates when the tickets <coughs> open when the tickets close when your reports are due if you have a an appeal that you would like to do on a report that you don't think that your data was treated fairly you have an appeal process um, and then there are the tasks you can enter data enroll look at your reports, log out. Um, once you log into a ticket to enter data, the specific series data entry is um, custom for everyone. We're looking at an oil seed meal here. And here's your constituent. So we tell you what constituents you are to enter. And then we kind of help people out. And we let you know what the decimal places should be. Um, we try and make this so blunders cannot happen. If we know that moisture should be between one and 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 five percent, we'll kind of set a range between zero and ten. So if you go to enter forty seven and you met four point seven, the system will kind of guide you in the right place so you don't make um, typo blunder errors. And then if you need to report things to more decimal places, you you absolutely can. There is a editable space that you can put in suggested methods and there are other things that you can enter as well. It's these tickets are completely customizable by our staff so we will work with the advisory panel to get things like um, brand name of the kit. So this could be what standards did you use? So this is brand name of the kit. It could be what standards did you use? So we're, we're looking into uh, possibly using this in the future, and I think that would make the data entry a little bit more straightforward. Do we have any more questions come in? I'm not seeing any more. Um, anybody, kind of last chance to throw some questions out there. Otherwise, we'll wrap this up. I'll remind everybody. Um, that this has been recorded and will be available for you um, to review. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to follow up with emails. And we'll do our best to, uh, to answer all of those that come in. Thanks again so much, everyone, for participating in this program. Um, we're so excited for the progress that we've made, and we look forward to further evolution. And um, we uh, hope that you'll continue to participate in, in these programs as they come out. It's really great for the industry. Um, we have one last question. It's simply when will the recordings be made available? And I hope to have that by the end of the day. But if not, you'll receive an email with links to both over the weekend. Um, I know some of you missed the potency, so you'll be able to grab those 
and, uh, and view those at your leisure. If you have questions that come out of reviewing the recordings, like I said, please don't hesitate to send them to us and we'll do our best to work with you through all of those. Um, we appreciate any uh, feedback and recommendations as well. So I guess that is a wrap. Um, Ken, Cynthia, great job. We appreciate everyone. Have a great day and a great weekend. Okay, Thanks, thank everybody. you very much, Wes.